Hey folks, we're going to do another Q&A here. Let's just jump right into it. First question, and we're getting a lot of these, is about, is the sun pulsing? I saw videos of the sun pulsing, is this real? No. Um, Photography 101, unless a camera or a telescope or anything like that is specifically made to be looking at the sun, don't point it at the sun. You're going to have light fluctuations. It's going to try to adjust to the light. Not only is that what you're seeing here, but remember, two to five billion people can see the sun at any given time of day. Something like that would be the biggest news story in the entire world. It would it would be bigger than uh, the virus, bigger than the warmongering with things with Russia, bigger than economic stories. And uh, once again, this is just what happens to cameras when you point them at the sun. Uh, I've been getting a lot more questions recently and I can tell these are newer folks who haven't uh, seen our videos on this. Um, why do scientists say that the last geomagnetic reversal was 780,000 years ago. What is this 12,000 year cycle you're talking about? Well, there's, there's a difference between what they call full cron magnetic reversals and a geomagnetic excursion, which is a rapid flip and then flip back. Uh, those are on the 12,000 year cycle while the longer cron reversals are on the hundreds of thousands of years cycle. That's what you see in the magnetic remnants in the ocean floor uh, sediments and other things like that completely different from the 12,000 year excursion cycle. Uh, we had Gothenburg 12,000 years ago. There was actually geomagnetic changes at the half cycle 6,000 and 18,000 years ago. The one 18,000 years ago was called Helena Poly. 24,000 years ago was Lake Mungo. Uh, in the 30 something thousand years ago range, it was Mono Lake. Before that, Lachamp, Vostok. Um, these are very real events and these are actually the ones that have more of the biosphere hits tied to them. These are the ones that uh, really create the disappearance of species, whereas you don't see as much of that during the thousands of years process where you get a full cron reversal. These geomagnetic excursions are actually worse for the biosphere. Uh, people have been asking, is there a glossary of space weather terms? How do we know what you're talking about when you show these charts about space weather? Well, first of all, we do have spaceweathernews.com and there are some explanations and links to explanatory videos on that page. But also, if you have Weatherman's Guide to the Sun, you know there is a glossary uh, in that book which goes through and clearly explains what all these terms mean, not to mention the fact that that's basically the premise of chapter one. Uh, been getting a lot of questions about a 2008 article from NASA about magnetic portals connecting the Earth and the Sun. This is the interplanetary magnetic field. Uh, there is a direct magnetic connection between the sun and all the planets. These flux transfer events through the magnetic portal, terrible name by the way, uh, happen at all the planets. They've been noticed at Mercury, they've been noticed at Mars, they've been noticed at Jupiter. Um, it's basically just the transfer of energy back and forth from the sun, uh, the electromagnetic transfer of energy. And yes, they do happen every eight minutes. The variation in this interplanetary magnetic field is usually what we're talking about when we discuss the BY of the solar wind. Uh, usually flips when we get a sector boundary uh, or a co-rotating interaction region. Basically, um, we tend to see most of the activity changing there right around the time that we're about to get a coronal hole stream impacting at Earth. It's nothing special. Like I said, magnetic portal is a terrible name. It starts to get the brain going in a way that's not really helpful for accurately understanding what these things are. Uh, get asked all the time, what are the top prep items that I recommend? Um, when it comes to the overall prepping, and this comes to uh, matter when it comes to just about any of these major events that we've been talking about, not only the things from the sun and the geomagnetism and the galactic magnetic reversal, uh, but an EMP, World War III, anything like that. But I'm going to specifically take it to the more natural uh, disasters that we talk about here. Uh, obviously, sustenance is number one. You need to have food and water. Uh, seeds, very important. And third, something floatable. Uh, the evidence of the cyclical deluge is pretty rock solid. The evidence that there are waves that go across the entire uh, go across entire continents is pretty solid, and so it does make sense that 
hey, you can plan and prep everything else in the world. And as we talked about in a previous Q&A, um, if you get unlucky, you get unlucky if the wave comes towards you. Uh, unless you're at the actual coastline, which I don't recommend at all for uh, this disaster at all. If you are inland and the wave gets to you, it's not going to be getting to you as something that's a mile high. It's going to be basically a fast moving high tide that rises and rises and rises for hours and you can just float away. Um, in the secondary class below, that would be things like protection, uh, Second Amendment, um, the books you have, the tools you have, things like that. But if I had to pick three, it would be sustenance so you don't die, seeds so you can actually plant, and three, uh, a floatable, something that can let you float away. Uh, last thing I'm going to hit here today is about solar forcing thresholds. This is something that climate scientists just can't seem to wrap around their heads. It's not like lines going like this and they all stay together and anytime one jostles, another one jostles. There are thresholds of forcing where once the sun whether it's a radiance, whether it's solar flaring, whether it's the solar wind or a geomagnetic storm, once it hits that, it critically changes the situation. And the example I like to give most often is the example of raw chicken. Let's say you get a piece of raw chicken and you measure the bacterial level at zero degrees, at 10 degrees, at 20 degrees, at 30 degrees. You can measure it everywhere in between there and you're just gonna get the same answer. There's bacteria here, there's bacteria here, there's bacteria here, and you could be tricked into thinking, oh, temperature doesn't have any effect whatsoever on the bacterial content of the chicken. But something interesting happens when you hit that critical threshold. The chicken cooks, it changes color, and all the bacteria die. Once you hit a certain threshold, the chicken is never going back to the way it was before. And that's the same thing when it comes to solar forcing of the climate, short-term weather events, uh, even things like seismicity and volcanoes. It is a threshold of forcing. And once hit, that's when a lot of the effects are actually able to be seen. Hopefully I answered your question. Uh, you submit these questions at suspiciousobservers.org because of how many we get. We only can answer about one in a hundred. We actually haven't even been getting to one in a hundred, but there's some, uh, there's some answers for those questions there. And I'll see you later. Be safe, everyone.